Book Three, Part One of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume Three by François René de Chateaubriand, translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. Book Three, Part One. God had pronounced one of those words by which the silence of eternity is at rare intervals interrupted. Then in the midst of the present generation rose the hammer that struck the hour which paris had only once heard sound on the twenty fifth of december four hundred and ninety six rheim announced the baptism of clovis and the gates of Letitia opened to the franks on the thirtieth of march eighteen fourteen after the baptism of blood of louis seize the old hammer which had so long remained motionless rose once more in the belfry of the ancient monarchy a second stroke resounded the tartars penetrated into paris in the interval of thirteen hundred and eighteen years the foreigner had insulted the walls of the capital of our empire without ever being able to enter it except when he glided in summoned by our own divisions the normans besieged the city of the parisi the parisi gave flight to the hawks which they carried on their wrists odo child of paris and future king rex futurus abon says drove back the pirates of the north the parisians let fly their eagles in eighteen fourteen the allies entered the louvre bonaparte had waged an unjust war against alexander his admirer who had begged on his knees for peace bonaparte had ordered the carnage of the moskowa he had forced the russians themselves to burn moscow bonaparte had plundered berlin humiliated its king insulted its queen what reprisals were we then to expect you shall see i had wandered in the floridas round unknown monuments devastated of old by conquerors of whom no trace remains and i was safe for the sight of the caucasian hordes encamped in the courtyard of the louvre in those events of history which according to montaigne are but weak testimonies of our worth and capacity my tongue cleaves to my palate adhere at lingua mea falcibus meis the allied army entered paris on the thirty first of march eighteen fourteen at midday ten days only after the anniversary of the death of the duc d'enghien twenty first march eighteen o four was it worth bonaparte's while to commit an action of such long remembrance for a reign which was to last so short a time the emperor of russia and the king of prussia rode at the head of their troops i saw them defile along the boulevards feeling stupefied and dumbfounded within myself as though my name as a frenchman had been torn from me to substitute for it the name by which i was thenceforth to be known in the mines of siberia i felt at the same time my exasperation increased against the man whose glory had reduced us to that disgrace nevertheless this first invasion of the allies has remained unparalleled in the annals of the world order peace and moderation reigned on every hand the shops were reopened russian guardsmen six feet tall were piloted through the streets by little french rogues who made fun of them as of jumping jacks and carnival maskers the conquered might be taken for the conquerors the latter trembling at their successes looked as though they were excusing themselves the national guard alone garrisoned the interior of paris with the exception of the houses in which the foreign kings and princes were lodged on the thirty first of march eighteen fourteen countless armies were occupying france a few months later all those troops passed back across our frontiers without firing a musket shot without shedding a drop of blood after the return of the bourbons old france found herself enlarged on some of her frontiers the ships and stores of antwerp were divided with her three hundred thousand prisoners scattered over the countries where victory or defeat had left them were restored to her after five and twenty years of fighting the clash of arms ceased from one end of europe to the other alexander departed leaving us the masterpieces which we had conquered and the liberty lodged in the charter a liberty which we owed as much to his enlightenment as to his influence the head of two supreme authorities twice an autocrat by the sword and by religion he alone of all the sovereigns of europe had understood that at the age of civilization which france had attained she could be governed only by virtue of a free constitution in our very natural hostility to the foreigners we have confused the invasion of eighteen fourteen and that of eighteen fifteen which were in no sense alike alexander looked upon himself merely as an instrument of providence and took no credit to himself when madame de steel complimented him upon the happiness which his subjects lacking a constitution enjoyed of being governed by him he made his well-known reply i am only a fortunate accident 
a young man in the streets of paris expressed to him his admiration at the affability with which he received the least of the citizens he replied for what else are sovereigns made he refused to inhabit the tuileries remembering that bonaparte had taken his ease in the palaces of vienna berlin and moscow looking at the statue of napoleon on the column in the place vendome he said if i were so high up i should be afraid of becoming giddy as he was going over the palace of the tuileries they showed him the salon de la paix of what use he asked laughing was this room to bonaparte on the day of louis the eighteenth's entry into paris alexander hid himself behind a window wearing no mark of distinction to watch the procession as it passed alexander sometimes had elegantly affectionate manners visiting a madhouse he asked a woman if there were many women mad through love not at present replied she but it is to be feared that the number has increased since the moment of your majesty's entry into paris one of napoleon's great dignitaries said to the czar your arrival has long been expected and wished for sire i should have come sooner he replied you must blame only french valour for my delay it is certain that when crossing the rhine he had regretted that he was not able to retire in peace to the midst of his family at the hotel des invalides he found the maimed soldiers who had defeated him at austerlitz they were silent and gloomy one heard nothing save the noise of their wooden legs in their deserted yard and their denuded church alexander was touched by this noise of brave men he ordered that twelve russian guns should be given back to them a proposal was made to him to change the name of the pont d'austerlitz no he said it is enough for me to have crossed the bridge with my army alexander had something calm and sad about him he went about paris on horseback or on foot without a suite and without affectation he appeared astonished at his triumph his almost melting gaze wandered over a population whom he seemed to regard as superior to himself one would have said that he thought himself a barbarian among us even as a roman felt shamefaced in athens perhaps also he reflected that these same frenchmen had appeared in his fired capital that his soldiers in their turn were masters of paris in which he might have been able to find again some of those now extinguished torches by which moscow was freed and consumed this destiny these changing fortunes this common misery of peoples and of kings were bound to make a profound impression upon a mind so religious as his what was the victor of the borodino doing so soon as he had heard of alexander's resolution he had sent orders to major maillard de lescourt of the artillery to blow up the grenelle powder magazine rostopchin had set fire to moscow but he had first sent away the inhabitants from fontainebleau to which he had returned napoleon marched to villejuif thence he threw a glance over paris foreign soldiers were guarding its gates the conqueror remembered the days in which his grenadiers kept watch on the ramparts of berlin moscow and vienna events destroy other events how poor a thing to-day appears to us the grief of henry the fourth learning of the death of gabriel at villejuif and returning to fontainebleau bonaparte also returned to that solitude he was awaited there only by the memory of his august prisoner the captive of peace had gone from the palace in order to leave it free for the captive of war so swiftly does misfortune fill up its places the regency had retired to blois bonaparte had given orders for the empress and the king of rome to leave paris saying that he would rather see them at the bottom of the seine than led back in triumph to vienna but at the same time he had enjoined joseph to remain in the capital his brother's retreat made him furious and he accused the ex-king of spain of ruining all the ministers the members of the regency napoleon's brothers his wife and his son arrived in disorder at blois swept away in the downfall military wagons baggage vans carriages everything was there the king's own coaches were there and were dragged through the mud of the boast to chambord the only morsel of france left to the heir of louis XIV. some of the ministers did not stop here but proceeded as far as brittany to hide themselves while cambaceres lolled in a sedan chair in the steep streets of blois various rumours were current there was talk of two camps and of a general requisition during several days they were ignorant of what was happening in paris the uncertainty did not cease until the arrival of a wagoner whose pass was signed sacken soon the russian general shuvalov alighted at the auberge de la galere he was suddenly besieged by the grandees and entreated to obtain a visa for their stampede however before leaving blois all drew upon the funds of the regency for their travelling expenses and their arrears of salary they held their passports in one hand and their money in the other taking care at the same time to send in their adhesion to the provisional government for they did not lose their heads madame mere and her brother cardinal fesch left for rome prince esterhazy came on behalf of francis the second 
to fetch Marie-Louise and her son. Joseph and Jerome withdrew to Switzerland, after vainly trying to compel the Empress to attach herself to their fate. Marie-Louise hastened to join her father. Indifferently attached to Bonaparte, she found means to console herself, and rejoiced at being delivered from the double tyranny of a husband and a master. When, in the following year, Bonaparte revisited that confusion of flight on the Bourbons, the latter, but lately rescued from their long tribulations, had not enjoyed fourteen years of unequal prosperity in which to accustom themselves to the comforts of the throne. However, Napoleon was not yet dethroned. More than forty thousand of the best soldiers in the world were around him. He was able to retire behind the Loire. The French armies which had arrived from Spain were growling in the south. The military population might bubble over and distribute its lava. Even among the foreign leaders there was still a question of Napoleon or his son reigning over France. For two days Alexander hesitated. M. de Talleyrand, as I have said, secretly leant towards the policy which tended to crown the King of Rome, for he dreaded the Bourbons. If he did not then accept entirely the plan of the regency of Marie-Louise, it was because, since Napoleon had not perished, he, the Prince de Benevent, feared that he would not be able to retain the mastery during a minority threatened by the existence of a restless, erratic, enterprising man still in the vigour of his age. It was in those critical days that I threw down my pamphlet, de Bonaparte et des Bourbons, to turn the scale, which result is well known. I flung myself headlong into the fray to serve as a shield to liberty, reviving against tyranny still subsisting, with its strength increased threefold by despair. I spoke in the name of the legitimacy, in order to add to my words the authority of positive affairs. I taught France what the old royal family was. I told her how many members of that family existed, what their names were and their character. It was as though I had drawn up a list of the children of the Emperor of China. To so great an extent had the Republic and the Empire encroached upon the present, and relegated the Bourbons to the past. Louis the Eighteenth declared, as I have already often mentioned, that my pamphlet was of greater profit to him than an army of one hundred thousand men. He might have added that it was a certificate of existence to him. I assisted in giving him the crown a second time, by the fortunate issue of the Spanish War. From the commencement of my political career, I became popular with the crowd, but from that time also I failed to make my way with powerful men. All who had been slaves under Bonaparte abhorred me. On the other side, I was an object of suspicion to all who wished to place France in a state of vassalage. At the first moment, among the sovereigns, I had none on my side except Bonaparte himself. He looked through my pamphlet at Fontainebleau. The Duc de Bassano had brought it to him. He discussed it impartially, saying, This is true, that is not true. I have nothing to reproach Chateaubriand with. He resisted me when I was in power. But those scoundrels, so-and-so, and he named them. My admiration for Bonaparte was always great and sincere, even at the time when I was attacking Napoleon with the greatest eagerness. Posterity is not so fair in its judgments as has been held. There are passions, infatuations, errors of distance, even as there are passions and errors of proximity. When posterity admires without reserve, it is scandalised that the contemporaries of the man admired should not have had the same idea of that man as itself. This can be explained, however. The things which offended one in that person are past. His infirmities have died with him. All that remains of him is his imperishable life but the evil which he caused is none the less real, evil in itself and in its essence, and especially for those who endured it. It is the style of the day to magnify Bonaparte's victories. The sufferers have disappeared. We no longer hear the imprecations, the cries of pain and distress of the victims. We no longer see France exhausted, with only women to till her soil. We no longer see parents arrested as a pledge for their sons, the inhabitants of the villages made jointly and severally responsible for the penalties applicable to a rebellious recruit. We no longer see those conscription placards posted at the street corners, the passers-by gathered before those enormous lists of dead, seeking in consternation the names of their children, their brothers, their friends, their neighbours. We forget that the whole population bewailed the triumphs. We forget that the slightest allusion against Bonaparte on the stage which had escaped the censors, was hailed with rapture. We forget that the people, the court, the generals, the ministers, Napoleon's relations, were weary of his oppressions and his conquests, weary of that game always being won, 
and always being played, of that existence brought into question each morning anew, thanks to the impossibility of repose. The reality of our sufferings is demonstrated by the catastrophe itself. If France had been infatuated with Bonaparte, would she twice have abandoned him, abruptly, completely, without making one last effort to keep him? If France owed all to Bonaparte, glory, liberty, order, prosperity, industry, commerce, manufactures, monuments, literature, fine arts, if, before his time, the nation had done nothing itself, if the Republic, destitute of genius and courage, had neither defended nor enlarged the territory, then France must have been very ungrateful, very cowardly, to allow Napoleon to fall into the hands of his enemies, or at least not to protest against the captivity of so great a benefactor. This reproach, which might justly be made against us, is not made against us, however. And why? Because it is evident that, at the moment of his fall, France did not desire to defend Napoleon. In our bitter mortification, we beheld in him only the author and the contemner of our wretchedness. The Allies did not defeat us. We ourselves, choosing between two scourges, renounced shedding our blood, which had ceased to flow for our liberties. The Republic had been very cruel, doubtless, but every one hoped that it would pass, that sooner or later we should recover our rights, while retaining the preservatory conquests which it had given us on the Alps and the Rhine. All the victories which it gained were won in our name. With the Republic there was no question save of France. It was always France that had triumphed, that had conquered. It was our soldiers who had done all, and for whom triumphal or funeral feasts were organised. The generals, and some were very great, obtained an honourable but modest place in the public memory. Such were Marceau, Moreau, Hoche, Joubert. The two last seemed destined to replace Bonaparte, who, in the dawn of his glory, suddenly crossed the path of General Hoche, and by his jealousy rendered illustrious that warlike pacificator who died unexpectedly, after his triumphs of Altkirchen, Neuwied, and Kleinister. Under the empire we disappeared. We were no longer mentioned. Everything belonged to Bonaparte. I have ordered, I have conquered, I have spoken, my eagles, my crown, my family, my subjects. What happened, however, in those two positions, at the same time similar and opposite, we did not abandon the Republic in its reverses. It killed us, but it honoured us. We had not the disgrace of being the property of a man. Thanks to our efforts, it was never invaded. The Russians, defeated beyond the mountains, met with their end at Zurich. As for Bonaparte, he, despite his enormous acquisitions, succumbed, not because he was conquered, but because France would have no more of him. How great a lesson! May it ever make us remember that there is cause of death in all that offends the dignity of man. Independent minds of every shade and opinion were employing uniform language at the time of the publication of my pamphlet. Lafayette, Camille Jordan, Ducis, Le Mercier, Langinet, Madame de Steel, Chenier, Benjamin Constant, Lebrun thought and wrote as I did. God, in his patient eternity, brings justice sooner or later. At moments when heaven seems to slumber, it is always a fine thing that the disapproval of an honest man should keep watch and remain as a curb upon the absolute power. France will not disown the noble souls which protested against her servitude when all lay prostrate, when there were so many advantages in so lying, so many favours to receive in return for flattery so many persecutions to undergo in return for sincerity. Honour, then, to the Lafayettes, the de Steels, the Benjamin Constants, the Camus Jordans, the Duces, the Le Mercier, the Langinet, the Cheniers, who, standing erect amidst the grovelling crowd of peoples and of kings, dared to despise victory and protest against tyranny. On the 2nd of April, the senators, to whom we owe one clause only, of the Charter of 1814, the contemptible clause preserving their pensions, decreed the deposition of bonaparte if this decree which emancipated france but brought infamy upon those who issued it offers an affront to the human race at the same time it teaches posterity the price of grandeurs and fortune when these have disdained to take their stand upon basis of morality justice and liberty decree of the conservative senate the conservative senate taking into consideration that in a constitutional monarchy the monarch exists only by virtue of the constitution or the social compact that napoleon bonaparte for some time maintaining a firm and prudent government had given the nation cause to reckon in the future upon acts of wisdom and justice 
but that subsequently he destroyed the compact which united him to the french people notably by levying imports and establishing taxes otherwise than by virtue of the law against the express tenor of the oath which he took on his accession to the throne in conformity with clause fifty three of the constitutions of the twenty eighth florial year twelve that he was guilty of this attempt upon the rights of the people at the very time when he had without necessity adjourned the legislative body and caused a report made by that body whose title and whose relation to the national representation he contested to be suppressed as criminal that he undertook a series of wars in violation of clause fifty of the act settling the constitution of the year eight which lays down that any declaration of war shall be proposed discussed decreed and promulgated like the laws that he has unconstitutionally issued several decrees bearing the penalty of death namely the two decrees of the fifth of march last tending to cause a war to be considered as national which was undertaken only in the interest of his own unmeasured ambition that he has violated the laws of the constitution by his decrees concerning the state prisons that he has annihilated the responsibility of the ministers put down all the powers and destroyed the independence of the courts of jurisdiction taking into consideration that the liberty of the press established and perpetuated as one of the rights of the nation has been constantly subjected to the arbitrary censorship of his police and that at the same time he has always made use of the press to fill france and europe with fabricated facts with false maxims with doctrines favourable to despotism and with outrages against foreign governments that acts and reports passed by the senate have undergone alterations when made public taking into consideration that instead of reigning with a sole view to the interest the happiness and the glory of the french people according to the terms of his oath napoleon has completed the misfortunes of the country by his refusal to treat on conditions which the national interest obliged him to accept and which did not compromise the honour of france by his abuse of all the means entrusted to him in men and money by his abandonment of the wounded without aid medical requisites or supplies by various measures which resulted in the ruin of the towns the depopulation of the rural districts famine and infectious disease taking into consideration that owing to all these causes the imperial government established by the senatus consultum of the twenty eighth florial year twelve or eighteenth may eighteen o four has ceased to exist and that the manifest desires of all frenchmen call into being an order of things of which the first result would be the restoration of general peace and which would also mark the epoch of a solemn reconciliation between all the states of the great family of europe the senate declares and decrees as follows napoleon deposed from the throne hereditary right abolished in his family the french people and the army released from the oath of fidelity to him the roman senate was less harsh when it declared nero a public enemy history is but a repetition of the same facts applied to varying men and times can one picture to oneself the emperor reading this official document at fontainebleau what must he have thought of what he had done and of the men whom he had summoned to be his accomplices in his oppression of our liberties when i published my pamphlet de bonaparte et des bourbons could i have expected to see it amplified and converted into a decree of deposition by the senate what prevented those legislators in the days of prosperity from discovering the evils of which they reproached bonaparte with being the author from perceiving that the constitution had been violated what zeal suddenly seized these mutes for the liberty of the press how did they who had overwhelmed napoleon with adulation upon his return from each of his wars now come to find that he had undertaken those wars only in the interest of his own unmeasured ambition how did they who had flung him so many conscripts to devour suddenly melt at the thought of the wounded soldiers abandoned without aid medical requisites or supplies there are times at which contempt should be but frugally dispensed because of the large number of those in need of it i pity them for this moment because they will need it again during and after the hundred days when i asked what napoleon at fontainebleau thought of the acts of the senate his answer was made an order of the day of fifth april eighteen fourteen not published officially but printed in different newspapers outside the capital thanked the army for its fidelity adding the senate has allowed itself to dispose of the government of france it has forgotten that it owes to the emperor the power which it is now abusing that it was he who saved one part of its members from the storms of the revolution drew the other from obscurity and protected it against the hatred of the nation the senate relies upon the clauses of the constitution to overthrow it it is not ashamed to utter reproaches against the emperor without remarking that in its capacity as the first body of the state it took part in all the events the senate is not ashamed to speak of the libels published against the foreign governments it forgets that these were drawn up in its midst 
so long as fortune remained faithful to their sovereign these men remained faithful and no complaint was heard of the abuses of power if the emperor had despised men as he has been reproached with doing then the world would recognize to-day that he has had reasons which justified his contempt this was a homage rendered by bonaparte himself to the liberty of the press he must have believed that there was some good in it since it offered him a last shelter and a last aid and i who am struggling with time i who am striving to make it give an account of what it has seen i who am writing this so long after the events that are past under the reign of philip the counterfeit heir of so great an inheritance what am i in the hands of that time that great devourer of the centuries which i thought fixed of that time which makes me whirl with itself through space alexander had taken up his residence at m de talleyrand's i was not present at the cabals you can read about them in the narratives of the abbe de prat and of the various intriguers who handled in their dirty and paltry paws the fate of one of the greatest men in history and the destiny of the world i counted for nothing in politics outside the masses there was no plotting understrapper but enjoyed far more right and favour in the antechambers than i a coming figure in the possible restoration i waited beneath the windows in the street through the machinations of the house in the rue saint florentin the conservative senate appointed a provisional government composed of general bernonville senator jocourt the duc de dalberg the abbe de montesquieu and dupont de nemours the prince de benevent helped himself to the presidency on meeting this name for the first time i ought to speak of the personage who took a remarkable part in the affairs of that time but i reserve his portrait for the end of my memoirs the intrigue which kept m de talleyrand in paris at the time of the entry of the allies was the cause of his successes at the commencement of the restoration the emperor of russia knew him from having seen him at tilsit in the absence of the french authorities alexander took up his quarters in the hotel de l'infantare which the owner hastened to offer him from that time forth m de talleyrand passed for the arbiter of the world his apartments became the centre of the negotiations composing the provisional government to his own liking he there placed the partners of his rubber the abbe de montesquieu figured in it only as an advertisement of the legitimacy to the bishop of autun's sterility were confided the first labours of the restoration he infected that restoration with barrenness and communicated to it a germ of blight and death the first acts of the provisional government placed under the dictatorship of its chairman were proclamations addressed to the soldiers and to the people soldiers they said to the former france has shattered the yoke under which she and you had been groaning for so many years see all that you have suffered at the hands of tyranny soldiers the time has come to put an end to the ills of the country you are her noblest children you cannot belong to him who has ravaged her who tried to make your name hated by all the nations who might perhaps have compromised your glory were it possible for a man who is not even a frenchman ever to impair the honour of our arms and the generosity of our soldiers and so in the eyes of his most servile slaves he who had won so many victories was no longer even a frenchman when in the days of the league dubourg surrendered the bastille to henry the fourth he refused to doff the black scarf and to take the money which was offered him for the surrender of the stronghold urged to recognize the king he replied that he was no doubt a very good prince but that he had pledged his faith to m de mayenne that moreover brissac was a traitor and that to prove it to him he would fight him between four pikes in the king's presence and would eat the heart out of his body a difference of times and men on the fourth of april appeared a new address of the provisional government to the people of france it said on emerging from your civil discords you chose as your leader a man who appeared upon the world's stage endowed with the characteristics of greatness on the ruins of anarchy he founded only despotism he ought at least out of gratitude to have become a frenchman like yourselves he has never been one without aim or object he has never ceased to undertake unjust wars like an adventurer seeking fame perhaps he is still dreaming of his gigantic designs even while unequal reverses are inflicting such striking punishment upon the pride and abuse of victory he has not known how to reign either in the national interest or even in the interest of his own despotism he has destroyed all that he wished to create and recreated all that he wished to destroy he believed in force alone to-day force overwhelms him 
a just retribution for an insensate ambition incontestable truths and well-earned curses but who was it that uttered those curses what became of my poor little pamphlet squeezed in between those virulent addresses did it not disappear entirely on the same day the fourth of april the provisional government proscribed the signs and emblems of the imperial government if the art de triomphe had existed it would have been pulled down my who was the first to vote for the death of louis xvi cambacerias who was the first to greet napoleon by the title of emperor eagerly recognized the acts of the provisional government on the sixth the senate drafted a constitution it rested nearly on the basis of the future charter the senate was preserved as an upper chamber the senatorial dignity was declared permanent and hereditary to the title to their property was attached the endowment of the senatorships the constitution made those titles and properties transmissible to the descendants of the holder fortunately those ignoble hereditary rights bore the fates within themselves as the ancients used to say the sordid effrontery of those senators who in the midst of the invasion of their country did not for a moment lose sight of themselves strikes one even in the immensity of public events would it not have been more convenient for the bourbons on attaining power to adopt the established government a dumb legislative body a secret and servile senate a fettered press on reflection one finds the thing to be impossible the natural liberties writing themselves in the absence of the arm that bent them would have resumed their vertical line under the weakness of the compression if the legitimate princes had disbanded bonaparte's army as they ought to have done this was napoleon's opinion in the island of elba and if at the same time they had retained the imperial government to break the instrument of glory in order to keep only the instrument of tyranny would have been too much the charter was the ransom of louis the eighteenth on the twelfth of april the comte d'artois arrived in the quality of lieutenant-general of the kingdom three or four hundred men went on horseback to meet him i was one of the band he charmed one with his kindly grace different from the manners of the empire the french recognized with pleasure in his person their old manners their old politeness and their old language the crowd pressed round him a consoling apparition of the past a twofold protection as he was against the conquering foreigner and against the still threatening bonaparte alas the prince was setting his foot again on french soil only to see his son assassinated there and to go back to die in the land of exile whence he was returning there are men round whose necks life has been flung like a chain i had been presented to the king's brother he had been given my pamphlet to read otherwise he would not have known my name he remembered to have seen me neither at the court of louis xvi nor at the camp of thionville and he had doubtless never heard speak of the genie du christianisme that was very simple when one has suffered much and long he remembers only himself personal misfortune is a somewhat cold yet exacting companion it possesses you it leaves no room for any other feeling never quits you seizes hold of your knees and your couch the day before the entry of the comte d'artois napoleon after some useless negotiations with alexander through the intermediary of m de Colincourt, had published his act of abdication the allied powers having proclaimed that the emperor napoleon was the sole obstacle to the restoration of peace in europe the emperor napoleon true to his oath declares that he renounces for himself and his heirs the throne of france and italy because there is no personal sacrifice even that of his life which he is not ready to make to the interests of the french to these sensational words the emperor did not delay by his return to give a no less sensational contradiction he needed only the time to go to elba he remained at fontainebleau till the twentieth of april the twentieth of april having arrived napoleon went down the double flight of steps leading to the peristyle of the deserted palace of the monarchy of the capets a few grenadiers the remnants of the soldiers who conquered europe drew up in line in the great courtyard as though on their last field of battle they were surrounded by those old trees the mutilated companions of francis i and henry the fourth bonaparte addressed the last witnesses of his fights in these words generals officers non-commissioned officers and men of my old guard i take my leave of you for twenty years i have been satisfied with you i have always found you on the road of glory the allied powers have armed all europe against me a part of the army has betrayed its duty and france herself has desired other destinies with you and the brave men who have remained faithful to me i could have kept up civil war for three years but france would have been unhappy 
which was contrary to the end which I proposed to myself. Be faithful to the new king whom France has chosen. Do not abandon our dear country, too long unhappy. Love her always, love her well, that dear country. Do not pity my lot. I shall always be happy when I know you to be so. I could have died, nothing would have been easier to me, but I shall never cease to follow the path of honour. I have yet to write what we have done. I cannot embrace you all, but I will embrace your general. Come, general. He pressed General Petit in his arms. Bring me the eagle. He kissed it. Dear eagle, may these kisses resound in the heart of all brave men. Farewell, my lads. My good wishes will always accompany you. Keep me in remembrance. These words spoken, Napoleon raised his tent, which covered the world. Bonaparte had applied to the Allies for commissaries, so that he might be protected by them on his journey to the island which the sovereigns granted him as his absolute property, and as an instalment on the future. Count Shuvalov was appointed for Russia, General Roller for Austria, Colonel Campbell for England, and Count Walberg Truxess for Prussia. The latter wrote the itinerary of Napoleon from Fontainebleau to Elba. This pamphlet and the Abbe de Prats on the Polish embassy are the two reports by which Napoleon was most pained. No doubt he then regretted the time of his liberal censorship, when he had poor Palm, the German bookseller, shot for distributing at Nuremberg, Herr von Gentz's work, Deutschland in seiner tiefsten Erniedrigung. Nuremberg, at the time of the publication of this work, was still a free city, and did not belong to France. Ought not Palm to have been able to foresee that conquest? Count Wahlberg begins by relating several conversations that took place at Fontainebleau previous to the departure. He states that Bonaparte awarded the greatest praise to Lord Wellington, and inquired as to his character and habits. He excused himself for not having made peace at Prague, Dresden, and Frankfurt. He agreed that he had been wrong, but that, at that time, he had had other views. I was no usurper, he added, because I accepted the crown only in compliance with the unanimous wish of the whole nation, whereas Louis the Eighteenth has usurped it, being called to the throne only by a vile senate, more than ten of whose members voted for the death of Louis XVI. Count Walberg pursues his narrative as follows. The emperor started with his four carriages about twelve o'clock on the twenty-first, not till after he had held a long conversation with General Roller, which he commenced with these words. Well, you heard my speech to the old guard yesterday. It pleased you, and you have seen the effect it produced. That is the way to speak and act with them, and if Louis XVIII does not follow this example, he will never make anything of the French soldier. From the spot where the French troops ceased, the cries of long live the emperor also had an end. Already in Moulin we saw the white cockades, and the inhabitants saluted us with, Long live the Allies! In Lyon, which we passed through at about eleven o'clock at night, a few people collected who received the emperor with, Long live Napoleon! As he had expressed a wish to be escorted by an English frigate to the island of Elba, Colonel Campbell left us at Lyon for the purpose of procuring one either from Toulon or Marseilles. About midday on the 24th, on this side Valence, Napoleon met Marshal Augereau. Both alighted from their carriages. The Emperor saluted the Marshal, embraced him, and took off his hat to him. Augereau returned none of these civilities. The Emperor, as he asked him, Where are you off to? Are you going to the court? took the Marshal by the arm and led him forwards. Augereau replied his present journey extended only to Lyon. They walked together for a quarter of a league on the road towards Valence, and according to authentic information the Emperor reproached the Marshal for his proclamation. Among other things he observed, Your proclamation is very silly. Why those insults against myself? All you need have said was, the nation having pronounced its wish in favour of a new sovereign, the duty of the army is to conform to it. God save the King. Long live Louis Eighteenth. Ergaro, who now likewise thou'd him, reproached him, on the other hand, with his insatiate love of conquest, to which he had sacrificed the happiness of France. At length, tired of the discourse, the Emperor turned suddenly towards the Marshal, embraced him, again took off his hat to him, and got into the carriage. Ergaro, who stood with his hands behind him, did not move his cap from his head, and as Napoleon was already in the carriage, drew one hand forwards in order to wave, with a mien bordering on contempt, a kind of farewell. On the 25th, as we arrived at Orange, we were received with, Long live the King! Long live Louis XVIII! On the same morning, close to Avignon, where the relays of horses awaited us, the Emperor found a crowd assembled, 
whose tumultuous cries saluted him with long live the king long live the allies down with nicolas down with the tyrant the scoundrel the wretched beggar and still coarser abuse in compliance with our instructions we did everything in our power to lighten the evil but could only partially effect it the people likewise conceived that we should not deny them the liberty of venting their indignation against the man who had made them so unhappy and even had the intention of rendering them still more miserable in Orgon, the next place where we changed horses the conduct of the populace was most outrageous exactly on the spot where the horses were taken out a gallows was erected on which a figure in french uniform sprinkled with blood was suspended on its breast it bore a paper with this inscription sooner or later this will be the tyrant's fate the rabble pressed around his carriage and elevated themselves on both sides in order to look and cast in their abuse the emperor pressed into a corner behind general bertrand and looked pale and disfigured but at length through our assistance he was happily brought off count shuvalov harangued the people from the side of bonaparte's carriage are you not ashamed said he to insult an unfortunate who has not the means of defending himself his situation is sufficiently humiliating for one who expecting to give laws to the world now finds himself at the mercy of your generosity leave him to himself behold him you see contempt is the only weapon you ought to employ against this man who is no longer dangerous it would be unworthy of the french nation to take any other vengeance the crowd applauded this harangue and bonaparte seeing the effect it produced made signs of approbation to Count Shuvalov, and afterwards thanked him for the service he had rendered him. When he had proceeded about a quarter of a league from Orgon, he changed his dress in his carriage, put on a plain blue greatcoat, and a round hat with a white cockade, mounted a post-horse, and rode on before as a courier. As it was some time ere we overtook him, we were perfectly ignorant of his being no longer in the carriage, and in St. Cana, where the horses were again changed. We still believed him to be in the greatest danger, for the people attempted to break open the doors, which, however, were fortunately locked. Had they succeeded, they would certainly have destroyed General Bertrand, who sat there alone. Characteristic is the prayer with which some of the women assailed me. For the love of God, deliver him up as a pillage to us. He has so well deserved it, both from you and us, that nothing can be more just than our request. Having overtaken the Empress carriage about half a league on the other side of Orgon, it shortly afterwards entered into a miserable public-house lying on the roadside called the calade we followed it and here first learnt bonaparte's disguise who in this attire had arrived here accompanied by one courier only his suite from the generals to the scullions were decorated with white cockades which he appeared previously to have provided himself with his valet de chambre who came to meet us begged we would conduct ourselves towards the emperor as if he were colonel campbell for whom on his arrival he had given himself out we entered and found in a kind of chamber this former ruler of the world buried in thought sitting with his head supported by his hand i did not immediately recognize him and walked towards him he started up as he heard somebody approaching and pointed to his countenance bedewed with tears he made a sign that i might not discover him requested me to sit down beside him and as long as the landlady was in the room conversed on indifferent subjects as soon however as she was gone out he resumed his former position we left him alone he sent however to request we would pass backwards and forwards to prevent any suspicion of his being there we informed him it was known colonel campbell had passed through here the day before on his way to toulon on which he determined upon assuming the name of lord burghesh here we dined but as the dinner had not been prepared by his own cooks he had not courage to partake of it for fear of being poisoned he felt ashamed however at seeing us all eat both with good appetites and good conscience and therefore helped himself from every dish but without swallowing the least morsel he spat everything out upon his plate or behind his chair a little bread and a bottle of wine taken from his carriage and which he divided with us constituted his whole repast in other respects he was conversable and extremely friendly towards us whenever the landlady who waited upon us at table left the room and he perceived we were alone he repeated to us his apprehensions for his life and assured us the french government had indisputably determined to destroy or arrest him here a thousand plans passed through his brain how he might escape and what arrangements ought to be made to deceive the people of aix whom he had learnt awaited him by thousands at the post-house the most eligible plan in his estimation would be to go back again to lyons and from thence strike into another road by way of italy 
to the island of elba this however we should on no account have allowed and we therefore endeavoured to persuade him to proceed either directly to toulon or by way of dean to fréjus we assured him that without our knowledge it was impossible the french government would entertain such insidious intentions against him and although the people allowed themselves the greatest improprieties they would never charge themselves with a crime of the nature he feared in order to inform us better and to convince us the inhabitants of that part of the country meditated his destruction he related to us what had happened to him as he arrived here alone the landlady who did not recognize him asked him well have you met bonaparte he replied in the negative i am curious she answered to see how he will save himself i do believe the people will murder him and it must be confessed he has well deserved it the scoundrel tell me are they going to put him on board ship for his island yes of course they will drown him i hope oh no doubt returned the emperor and so you see he added turning towards us the danger i am exposed to and now again with all his apprehensions and indecision he renewed his solicitations of counsel he even begged us to look around and see if we could not anywhere discover a private door through which he might slip out or if the window whose shutters upon entering he had half closed at the bottom was too high for him to jump out in case of need on examination i found the window was provided with an iron trellis work on the outside and threw him into evident consternation as i communicated to him the discovery at the least noise he started up in terror and changed colour after dinner we left him alone and as we went in and out found him frequently weeping as general shuvalov's adjutant had announced that the major part of the populace assembled on the road were dispersed the emperor towards midnight determined on proceeding for greater precaution however another disguise was assumed general shuvalov's adjutant was obliged to put on the blue greatcoat and round hat in which the emperor had reached the inn that in case of necessity he might be regarded insulted or even murdered for him napoleon who now pretended to be an austrian colonel dressed himself in the uniform of general roller with the order of theresa wore my camp cap and cast over his shoulders general shuvalov's mantle after the allies had thus equipped him the carriages drove up and we were obliged to march them through the other rooms of the inn in a certain order which had been previously tried in our own chamber the procession was headed by general drouot then came as emperor general shuvalov's adjutant upon this general roller the emperor general shuvalov and lastly myself to whom the honour of forming the rear-guard was assigned the remainder of the imperial suite united themselves with us as we passed by and thus we walked through the gaping multitude who vainly endeavoured to distinguish their tyrant amongst us shuvalov's adjutant major olivif placed himself in napoleon's carriage and the latter sat beside general roller in his calash still however the emperor was constantly in alarm he not only remained in general roller's calash but even begged he would allow the servant to smoke who sat before and asked the general himself if he could sing in order that he might dissipate through such familiar conduct any suspicion in the places where we stopped that the emperor sat with him in the carriage as the general could not sing napoleon begged him to whistle and with this singular music we made our entry into every place whilst the emperor fumigated with the incense of the tobacco-pipe pressed himself into the corner of the calash and pretended to be fast asleep at st maximin he breakfasted with us and having learnt that the sub-prefect of aix was there he ordered him into his presence and received him with these words you ought to blush to see me in an austrian uniform which i have been obliged to assume to protect myself against the insults of the provencals i came among you in full confidence whilst i might have brought with me six thousand of my guard and i find nothing but a band of maniacs who put my life in danger the provencals are a disgraceful race they committed every kind of crime and enormity during the revolution and are quite ready to begin over again but when it is a question of fighting bravely then they are cowards provence has never supplied me with a single regiment with which i could be satisfied but to-morrow they will be as much against louis the eighteenth as to-day they appear to be against me etc to us he again spoke of louis the eighteenth and said he would never effect anything with the french nation if he treated them with too much forbearance he would from necessity be obliged to lay large imposts upon them and hence cause himself to be immediately hated he likewise told us that eighteen years before he had marched through this place with some thousand men to liberate two royalists who were to have been executed for wearing the white cockade 
in spite however of the fury of the populace with which he had to contend he fortunately saved them and to-day he continued would that man be murdered by this same populace who should refuse to wear a white cockade so contradictory and vacillating are they in everything they do having learnt that two squadrons of austrian hussars were stationed at luc an order was sent at his request to the commanders to await our arrival there in order to escort the emperor to Fréjus. End of Book Three, Part One. Book Three, Part Two of the Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Memoirs of Chateaubriand, Volume Three, by François René de Chateaubriand translated by alexander teixeira de matos book three part two here ends count walberg's narrative those accounts are painful to read what were the commissaries unable to afford better protection to him for whom they had the honour to be responsible who were they to affect these airs of superiority with such a man bonaparte truly said that if he had wished he might have travelled accompanied by a portion of his guard it is evident that men were indifferent to his fate they enjoyed his degradation they gladly acquiesced in the marks of indignity which the victim demanded for his safety it is so sweet to hold beneath one's feet the destiny of him who walked over the highest heads to avenge pride with insult therefore the commissaries do not expend a word not even a word of philosophic sensibility on such a change of fortune to remind man of his nothingness and of the greatness of the judgments of god in the ranks of the allies napoleon had had numerous adulators he who has gone on his knees before brute force is not entitled to triumph over misfortune prussia i admit had need of an effort of virtue to forget what she had suffered herself her king and her queen but that effort should have been made alas bonaparte had taken pity on nothing all hearts had cooled towards him the moment in which he showed himself most cruel was at jaffa the smallest on the way to elba in the first case military necessity served as his excuse in the second the harshness of the foreign commissaries changes the course of the reader's feelings and lessens his own abasement the provisional government of france does not itself seem to me quite without reproach i reject the calumnies of Mabui. nevertheless amid the terror with which napoleon still inspired his former servants a fortuitous catastrophe might have presented itself in their eyes in the light only of a misfortune one would gladly doubt the truth of the facts reported by count walberg truxess but general collin in a sequel to walberg's itinerary has confirmed a part of his colleague's narrative general Shuvalov, on his part has certified in conversation with myself the exactness of the facts his measured words said more than walberg's expansive recital lastly fabri's itinéraire is composed of authentic french documents furnished by eye-witnesses now that i have done justice on the commissaries and the allies is it really the conqueror of the world whom one sees in walberg's itinerary the hero reduced to disguises and tears weeping under a post-boy's jacket in the corner of a back room at an inn was it thus that marius bore himself on the ruins of carthage that hannibal died in bithynia caesar in the senate how did pompey disguise himself by covering his head with his toga he who had donned the purple taking shelter beneath the white cockade uttering the cry of safety god save the king that king one of whose heirs he had had shot the master of the nations encouraging the commissaries in the humiliations which they heaped upon him in order the better to hide him delighted to have general cola whistling before him and a coachman smoking in his face compelling general chivalos aide-de-camp to enact the part of the emperor while he bonaparte wore the dress of an austrian colonel and wrapped himself in the cloak of a russian general he must have loved life cruelly those immortals cannot consent to die moreau said of bonaparte his chief characteristics are falsehood and the love of life let me beat him and i should see him at my feet begging me for mercy moreau thought thus being unable to grasp bonaparte's nature he fell into the same error as lord byron at least at st helena napoleon dignified by the muses although petty in his quarrels with the english governor had to support only the weight of his own immensity 
in france the evil which he had done appeared to him personified by the widows and orphans and constrained him to tremble before the hands of a few women this is too true but bonaparte should not be judged by the rules applied to great geniuses because he was lacking in magnanimity there are men who have the faculty of rising and who have not the faculty of descending napoleon possessed both faculties like the rebellious angel he was able to contract his incommensurable stature so as to enclose it within a measured space his ductility furnished him with means of safety and regeneration with him all was not finished when he seemed to have finished changing his manners and costume at will as perfect in comedy as in tragedy this actor knew how to appear natural in the slave's tunic as in the king's mantle in the part of Atalus, or in the part of caesar another moment and you shall see from the depth of his degradation the dwarf raising his briary and head asmodeus will come forth in a huge column of smoke from the flask into which he had compressed himself napoleon valued life for what it brought him he had the instinct of that which yet remained to him to paint he did not wish his canvas to fail him before he had completed his pictures writing of napoleon's fears sir walter scott less unfair than the commissaries frankly remarks that the unkindness of the people made much impression on bonaparte that he even shed tears that he showed more fear of assassination than seemed consistent with his approved courage but he adds it must be recollected that the danger was of a new and particularly horrible description and calculated to appall many to whom the terrors of a field of battle were familiar the bravest soldier might shudder at a death like that of the de Witts. napoleon was made to undergo this revolutionary anguish in the same places where he commenced his career with the terror the prussian general once interrupting his recital thought himself obliged to reveal a disorder which the emperor did not conceal count Volberg may have confused what he saw with the sufferings which m de ségur witnessed in the russian campaign when bonaparte compelled to alight from his horse leant his head against the guns among the number of the infirmities of illustrious warriors true history reckons only the dagger which pierced the heart of henry the fourth or the ball which killed turenne after describing bonaparte's arrival at Fréjus, sir walter scott rid of the great scenes joyfully falls back upon his talent he goes his way gossiping as madame de sévigné says he chats of napoleon's passage to elba of the seduction exercised by napoleon over the english sailors excepting hinton who could not hear the praises given to the emperor without muttering the word humbug when napoleon left the ship hinton wished his honour good health and better luck the next time napoleon typified all the littlenesses and all the greatnesses of mankind while bonaparte known to the universe was escaping amid curses from france louis the eighteenth everywhere forgotten was leaving london under a canopy of white banners and crowns napoleon on landing in the island of elba found back his strength there louis the eighteenth on landing at calais might have seen louvel he met general maison commissioned sixteen years after to put charles x on board at cherbourg charles x apparently to render him worthy of his future mission later gave m maison the baton of a marshal of france even as a knight before fighting conferred knighthood upon the man of lower rank with whom he deigned to measure swords i dreaded the effect of louis the eighteenth's appearance i hastened to go ahead of him to the residence whence joan of arc fell into the hands of the english and where i was shown a volume struck by one of the cannonballs hurled against bonaparte what would people think at the sight of the royal invalid replacing the horseman who might have said with attila the grass no longer grows wherever my horse has passed with no mission or taste for it i undertook i was clearly under a spell a somewhat difficult task that of describing the arrival at compiegne of causing the son of st louis to be seen as i idealized him by the aid of the muses i expressed myself thus the king's coach was preceded by the generals and the marshals of france who had gone to meet his majesty there were no more cries of god save the king but confused clamours amid which one distinguished only accents of tender emotion and joy the king wore a blue coat marked only by a star and a pair of epaulettes his legs were encased in wide gaiters of red velvet edged with a narrow gold braid seated in his armchair with his old-fashioned gaiters holding his cane between his knees he suggests louis quatorze at fifty years of age 
marshals macdonald ney moncy serurier brune the prince de neuchatel all the generals all the persons present alike received the most affectionate words from the king so great in france is the power of the legitimate sovereign the magic attached to the name of the king a man arrives alone from exile despoiled of everything without a following guards or riches he has nothing to give almost nothing to promise he alights from his carriage leaning on the arm of a young woman he shows himself to captains who have never seen him to grenadiers who hardly know his name who is that man tis the king every one falls at his feet what i said above of the warriors with the object which i was proposing to attain was true as regards the leaders but i lied with respect to the soldiers i have present in my memory as though i saw it still the spectacle which i witnessed when louis the eighteenth entering paris on the third of may went to visit notre dame they had wished to spare the king the sight of the foreign troops a regiment of the old foot guards kept the line from the pont neuf to notre dame along the quai des orfèvres i do not believe that human faces ever wore so threatening and so terrible an expression those grenadiers covered with wounds the conquerors of europe who had seen so many thousands of cannonballs pass over their heads who smelt of fire and powder those same men robbed of their captain were forced to salute an old king disabled by time not war watched as they were by an army of russians austrians and prussians in napoleon's invaded capital some moving the skin of their foreheads brought down their great bearskin busbies over their eyes as though to keep them from seeing others lowered the corners of their mouth in angry scorn others again showed their teeth through their mustachios like tigers when they presented arms it was with a furious movement and the sound of those arms made one tremble never we must admit have men been put to so great a test and suffered so dire a torment if at that moment they had been summoned to vengeance it would have been necessary to exterminate them to the last or they would have swallowed the earth at the end of the line was a young hussar on horseback he held a drawn sword and made it leap and as it were dance with a convulsive movement of anger his face was pale his eyes rolled in their sockets he opened and shut his mouth by turns clashing his teeth together and stifling cries of which one heard only the first sound he caught sight of a russian officer the look which he darted at him cannot be described when the king's carriage passed before him he made his horse spring and certainly he had the temptation to fling himself upon the king the restoration committed an irreparable mistake at its outset it ought to have disbanded the army while retaining the marshals generals military governors and officers in their pensions honours and rank the soldiers would afterwards have successively returned into the reconstituted army as they have since done into the royal guard the legitimate monarchy would not then have had against it from the first those soldiers of the empire organized divided into brigades denominated as they had been in the days of their victories unceasingly talking together of the time that was past nourishing regrets and feelings hostile to their new master the miserable resurrection of the maison rouge that mixture of soldiers of the old monarchy and fighting men of the new empire augmented the evil to believe that veterans distinguished on a thousand battlefields would not be offended at seeing young men very brave no doubt but for the most part new to the calling of arms wearing symbols of high military rank without having earned them was to betray a want of knowledge of human nature alexander had been to visit louis the eighteenth during the stay which the latter made at compiegne louis eighteen offended him by his haughtiness this interview led to the declaration of saint ouen of the second of may the king said in this that he had resolved to give as the basis of the constitution which he proposed to award to his people the following guarantees representative government divided into two bodies taxes freely granted public and individual liberty liberty of the press liberty of public worship sacred inviolability of property irrevocability of the sale of national goods irremovable judges and an independent judicial bench every frenchman admissible to every employment etc etc this declaration although it was in keeping with louis the eighteenth's intelligence nevertheless pertained neither to him nor to his advisers it was simply the time which was issuing from its rest its wings had been folded its soaring suspended since seventeen ninety two it was now resuming its flight or its course the excesses of the terror the despotism of bonaparte had caused ideas to turn back again but so soon as the obstacles that had been opposed to them were destroyed they flowed into the bed which they were at the same time to follow and to dig matters were taken up at the point at which they had been stopped all that had passed was as though it had not happened 
the human race thrust back to the commencement of the revolution had only lost forty years of its life well what is forty years in the general life of society that gap disappears when the cut fragments of time have been joined together the treaty of paris between the allies and france was concluded on the thirtieth of may eighteen fourteen it was agreed that within two months all the powers engaged on either side in the present war should send plenipotentiaries to vienna to settle the final arrangements in a general congress on the fourth of june louis the eighteenth appeared in royal session in a collective assembly of the legislative body and a fraction of the senate he delivered a noble speech old bygone worn out these wearisome details now serve only as an historic thread to the greater part of the nation the charter possessed the drawback of being granted this most useless word stirred up the burning question of royal or popular sovereignty louis the eighteenth also dated his boon from the nineteenth year of his reign considering that of bonaparte as null and void in the same way as charles the second had taken a clean leap over cromwell's head it was a kind of insult to the sovereigns who had all recognized napoleon and who were at that very moment in paris that obsolete language and those pretensions of the ancient monarchies added nothing to the lawfulness of the right and were mere puerile anachronisms that apart the charter replacing despotism bringing us legal liberty was calculated to satisfy conscientious men nevertheless the royalists who had gained so many advantages by it who issuing from their village or their paltry fireside or the obscure posts on which they had lived under the empire were called to a lofty and public existence received the boon only in a grudging spirit the liberals who had accommodated themselves wholeheartedly to the tyranny of bonaparte thought the charter a regular slave code we have returned to the time of babel but we no longer work at a common monument of confusion each builds his tower to his own height according to his strength and stature for the rest if the charter appeared defective it was because the revolution had not run its course the principles of equality and democracy lay at the bottom of men's minds and worked in a contrary direction to the monarchical order the allied princes lost no time in leaving paris alexander when going away had a religious sacrifice celebrated on the place de la concorde an altar was erected where the scaffold of louis xvi had stood seven muscovite priests performed the service and the foreign troops defiled before the altar the te deum was sung to one of the beautiful airs of the old greek music the soldiers and the sovereigns bent their knee to the ground to receive the benediction the thoughts of the french were carried back to seventeen ninety three and seventeen ninety four when the oxen refused to go over pavements which the smell of blood made hateful to them what hand had led to the expiatory festival those men of all countries those sons of the ancient barbarian invasions those tartars some of whom dwelt in sheepskin tents beneath the great wall of china those are spectacles which the feeble generations that will follow my century shall no longer see in the first year of the restoration i assisted at the third transformation of society i had seen the old monarchy turn into the constitutional monarchy and the latter into the republic i had seen the republic change into military despotism i had seen military despotism turn back into a free monarchy the new ideas and the new generations returned to the old principles and the old men the marshals of the empire become marshals of france with the uniforms of napoleon's guard were mingled the uniforms of the bodyguards and the maison rouge cut precisely after the old patterns the old duke d'avray with his powdered wig and his black cane ambled along with shaking head as captain of the bodyguards near marshal victor limping in the bonaparte style the duc de mouchy who had never seen a shot fired went into mass near marshal Oudinot, riddled with wounds the palace of the tuileries so proper and soldierly under napoleon became filled instead of the smell of powder with the odours of the breakfasts which ascended on every side under monsieur the lords of the bedchamber with monsieur the officers of the mouth and the wardrobe everything resumed an air of domesticity in the streets one saw decrepit emigrants wearing the airs and clothes of former days most respectable men no doubt but appearing as outlandish among the modern crowd as did the republican captains among the soldiers of napoleon the ladies of the imperial court introduced the dowagers of the faubourg saint germain and taught them their way about the palace there arrived deputations from bordeaux adorned with armlets parish captains from the vendee wearing la roche jacqueline hats these different persons retained the expression of the feelings thoughts habits manners familiar to them liberty which lay at the root of that period 
made things exist together which at first sight appeared as though they ought not to exist but one had difficulty in recognising that liberty because it wore the colours of the ancient monarchy and of the imperial despotism every one too was badly acquainted with the language of the constitution the royalists made glaring errors when talking charter the imperialists were still less well informed the conventionals who had become in turn counts barons senators of napoleon and peers of louis the eighteenth lapsed at one time into the republican dialect which they had almost forgotten at another into the absolutist idiom which they had learned thoroughly lieutenant-generals had been promoted to gamekeepers ed de comp of the last military tyrant were heard to prate of the inviolable liberty of the peoples and regicides to sustain the sacred dogma of the legitimacy these metamorphoses would be hateful if they did not in part belong to the flexibility of the french genius the people of athens governed itself orators appealed to its passions in the public places the sovereign crowd was composed of sculptors painters artisans who are wont to be spectators of speeches and hearers of deeds as thucydides says but when good or bad the decree had been delivered who issued to execute it from amid that incoherent and inexpert mass socrates phocion pericles alcibiades is it the royalists who are to blame for the restoration as is urged to-day not in the least it was as though one should say that thirty millions of men had stood aghast while a handful of legitimists accomplished a detested restoration against the wish of all by waving a few handkerchiefs and putting a ribbon of their wives in their hats the vast majority of frenchmen was it is true full of joy but that majority was not a legitimist one in the limited sense of the word applicable only to the rigid partisans of the old monarchy the majority was a mass composed of every shade of opinion happy at being delivered and violently incensed against the man whom it accused of all its misfortunes hence the success of my pamphlet how many avowed aristocrats were numbered among those who proclaimed the king's name messieurs mathieu and adrien de montmorency the messieurs de polignac escaped from their jail monsieur alexis de noailles monsieur sosten de la rochefoucauld did those seven or eight men whom the people neither recognised nor followed lay down the law to a whole nation madame de montcalm had sent me a bag containing twelve hundred francs to distribute among the pure legitimist race i sent it back to her not having succeeded in placing a crown piece an ignominious cord was fastened round the neck of the statue which surmounted the column in the place vendome there were so few royalists to raise a hubbub around glory and to pull at the rope that the authorities themselves bonapartes all had to lower their master's image with the aid of a scaffold the colossus was forced to bow his head he fell at the feet of the sovereigns of europe who had so often lain prostrate before him it was the men of the republic and of the empire who enthusiastically greeted the restoration the conduct and ingratitude of the persons raised by the revolution were abominable towards him whom they affect to-day to regret and admire imperialists and liberals it is you into whose hands the power fell you who knelt down before the sons of henry the fourth it was quite natural that the royalists should be happy to recover their princes and to see the end of the reign of him whom they regarded as an usurper but you the creatures of that usurper surpassed the feelings of the royalists in exaggeration the ministers the high dignitaries vied with each other in taking the oath to the legitimacy all the civil and judicial authorities crowded on each other's heels to swear hatred against the proscribed new dynasty and love to the ancient race whom they had a hundred and a hundred times condemned who drew up those proclamations those adulatory addresses so insulting to napoleon with which france was flooded the royalists no the ministers the generals the authorities chosen and maintained in office by bonaparte where was the jobbing of the restoration done at the royalists no at m de talleyrand's with whom with m de pratt almoner to the god mars and mitred mountebank where and with whom did the lieutenant-general of the kingdom dine on his arrival at the royalists and with royalists nope at the bishop of autun's with m de colancourt where were entertainers given to the infamous foreign princes at the country-houses of the royalists no at Malmaison, at the empress josephine's to whom did napoleon's dearest friends berthier for instance carry their ardent devotion to the legitimacy who spent their existences with the emperor alexander with that brutal tartar the classes of the institute the scholars the men of letters the philosophers philanthropists 
theophilanthropists, and others. They return enchanted, laden with praises and snuff-boxes. As for us poor devils of legitimists, we were admitted nowhere, we went for nothing. Sometimes we were told in the streets to go home to bed. Sometimes we were recommended not to shout God save the King too loud, others having undertaken that responsibility. So far from compelling any one to be a legitimist, those in power declared that nobody would be obliged to change his conduct or his language, that the Bishop of Autun would be no more compelled to say Mass under the royalty than he had been compelled to attend it under the Empire. I saw no lady of the castle keep, no Joan of Arc proclaim the rightful sovereign with falcon on wrist or lance in hand. But Madame de Talleyrand, whom Bonaparte had fastened to her husband like a signboard, drove through the streets in a calash, singing hymns on the pious family of the Bourbons. A few sheets fluttering from the windows of the familiars of the imperial court made the good Cossacks believe that there were as many lilies in the hearts of the converted Bonapartists as white rags at their casements. It is wonderful how far contagion will go in France, and a man would cry, Off with my head, if he heard his neighbour cry the same. The imperialists went so far as to enter our houses and make us Bourbonists put out, by way of spotless flags, such white remnants as our presses contain. This happened at my house, but Madame de Chateaubriand would have none of it, and valiantly defended her muslins. The legislative body transformed into a chamber of deputies, and the House of Peers, composed of a hundred and fifty-four members, appointed for life, and including over sixty senators, formed the two first legislative chambers. M. de Talleyrand, installed at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, left for the Congress of Vienna, the opening of which was fixed for the 3rd of November, in execution of Clause 32 of the Treaty of the 30th of May. M. de Jocourt held the portfolio during an interim which lasted until the Battle of Waterloo. The Abbé de Montesquieu became Minister of the Interior, having M. Guizot as his Secretary-General. M. Maluet entered the Admiralty. He died and was succeeded by M. Bernier. General Dupont obtained the War Office. He was replaced by Marshal So, who distinguished himself through the erection of the funeral monument at Quiberon. The Duc de Blacas was Minister of the Royal Household. M. Anglais, Prefect of Police, Councillor d'Ombray, Minister of Justice, the Abbé Louis, Minister of Finance. On the 21st of October, the Abbé de Montesquieu introduced the first law on the subject of the press. It submitted every writing of less than twenty pages of print to the censorship. M. Guizot worked out this first law of liberty. Carnot addressed a letter to the King. He admitted that the Bourbons had been joyfully received but taking no account of the shortness of the time, nor of all that the Charter granted, he gave haughty lessons together with risky advice. All this is worth nothing, when one has to accept the rank of minister and the title of Count of the Empire. It is not becoming to show one's self proud towards a weak and liberal prince, when one has been submissive towards a violent and despotic prince, when, a worn-out machine of the terror, one has found oneself unequal to the calculation of the proportions of Napoleonic warfare. I send to the press, in reply, my Reflexion Politique. They contain the substance of the Monarchie selon la Charte. M. Lenné, the President of the Chamber of Deputies, spoke of this work to the King with praise. The King always seemed charmed with the services which I had the happiness to render him. Heaven seemed to have thrown over my shoulders the mantle of herald of the legitimacy. But the greater the success of the work, the less did its author please His Majesty. Their reflection politique divulged my constitutional doctrines. The court received an impression from them which my fidelity to the Bourbons has been unable to wipe out. Louis the Eighteenth used to say to his intimates, Beware of ever admitting a poet into your affairs, he will ruin all. Those people are good for nothing. A powerful and lively friendship at that time filled my heart. The Duchesse de Duras had imaginative powers, and even some of the facial expression of Madame de Steel. She has given a proof of her talent as an author in Ourika. On her return from the emigration, she led a secluded life, for many years, in her Chateau d'Ussay, on the banks of the Loire, and I first heard speak of her in the beautiful gardens at Merville, after having passed near her in London without meeting her. She came to Paris for the education of her charming daughters, Felicie and Clara. Relations of family, province, literary and political opinion opened the door of her company to me. Her warmth of soul, her nobility of character, her loftiness of mind, her generosity of sentiment made her a superior woman. At the commencement of the Restoration she took me under her protection, for, in spite of all that I had done, 
for the legitimate monarchy and the services which louis the eighteenth confessed that he had received from me i had been placed so far on one side that i was thinking of retiring to switzerland perhaps i should have done well in those solitudes which napoleon had intended for me as his ambassador to the mountains might i not have been happier than in the palace of the tuileries when i entered those halls on the return of the legitimacy they made upon me an impression almost as painful as on the day when i saw bonaparte there prepared to kill the duc d'enguerre madame de duras spoke of me to m de blacas he replied that i was quite free to go where i would madame de duras was so tempestuous so courageous on behalf of her friends that a vacant embassy was dug up the embassy to sweden louis the eighteenth already wearied of my noise was happy to make a present of me to his good brother king bernadotte did the latter imagine that i was being sent to stockholm to dethrone him by the lord ye princes of the earth i dethrone nobody keep your crowns if you can and above all do not give them to me for i will none of them madame de duras an excellent woman who allowed me to call her my sister and whom i had the happiness of seeing in paris during many years went to nice to die one more wound reopened the duchesse de duras saw much of madame de steel i cannot conceive how i did not come across madame recamier who had returned from italy to france i should have greeted the succour which came in aid of my life already i no longer belonged to those mornings which console themselves i was on the verge of those evening hours which stand in need of consolation on the thirtieth of december of the year eighteen fourteen the legislative chambers were prorogued to the first of may eighteen fifteen as though they had been convoked for the assembly of bonaparte's champ de may on the eighteenth of january the remains were exhumed of marie antoinette and louis Seize. i was present at this exhumation in the cemetery in which fontaine and percier have since at the pious call of madame la dauphine and in imitation of a sepulchral church at rimini raised what is perhaps the most remarkable monument in paris this cloister formed of a concatenation of tombs strikes the imagination and fills it with sadness i have spoken in book four of these memoirs of the exhumations of eighteen fifteen in the midst of the bones i recognized the queen's head by the smile which that head had given me at versailles on the twenty first of january was laid the first stone of the groundwork of the statue which was to be erected on the place louis quinze and which was never erected i wrote the funeral splendour of the twenty first of january i said the monks who came with the oriflamme to meet the shrine of st louis will not receive the descendant of the sainted king in the subterraneous abodes where dwelt those annihilated kings and princes louis says will lie alone how is it that so many dead have risen why is saint denis deserted let us rather ask why its roof has been restored why its altar is left standing what hand has reconstructed the vault of those caverns and prepared those empty tombs the hand of that same man who was seated on the throne of the bourbons o providence he thought that he was preparing sepulchres for his race and he was but building the tomb of louis xvi i long wished that the image of louis xvi might be set up on the spot where the martyr shed his blood i should no longer be of that opinion the bourbons must be praised for thinking of louis xvi at the first moment of their return they were bound to touch their foreheads with his ashes before placing his crown on their heads now i think that they ought not to have gone further it was not in paris as in london a committee which tried the monarch it was the whole convention thence the annual reproach which a repeated funeral ceremony seemed to make to the nation apparently represented by a complete assembly every people has fixed anniversaries for the celebration of its triumphs its disorders or its misfortunes for all have in an equal measure desired to keep up the memory of one and the other we have had solemnities for the barricades songs for st bartholomew's night feasts for the death of capet but is it not remarkable that the law is powerless to create days of remembrance whereas religion has made the obscure saint live on from age to age if the fasts and prayers instituted for the sacrifice of charles i still survive it is because in england the state unites religious to political supremacy and because by virtue of that supremacy the thirtieth of january sixteen forty nine has become a feria in france things go differently rome alone has the right to command in religion thenceforth of what value is an order published by a prince a decree promulgated by a political assembly if another prince another assembly have the right to expunge them i therefore think to-day that the symbol of a feast which may be abolished or the evidence of a tragic catastrophe not consecrated by religion is not fitly placed on the road of the crowd 
carelessly and heedlessly pursuing its pleasures. At the time in which we live, it is to be feared, lest a monument raised with the object of impressing horror of popular excesses might prompt the longing to imitate them. Evil tempts more than good. When wishing to perpetuate the sorrow, one often perpetuates only the example. The centuries do not adopt the bequests of mourning. They have present cause enough for weeping, without undertaking to shed hereditary tears as well. On beholding the catafalque leaving the cemetière de Descloiseaux, laden with the remains of the Queen and King, I felt a strong emotion. I followed it with my eyes with a fatal presentiment. At last Louis XVI resumed his couch at Saint-Denis. Louis XVIII, on his side, slept at the Louvre. The two brothers were together commencing a new era of legitimate kings and sceptres, vain restoration of the throne and the tomb, of which time has already swept away the dual dust. Since I have spoken of those funeral ceremonies which were so often repeated, I will tell you of the incubus with which I used to be oppressed when, after the ceremony, I walked in the evening in the half-undraped basilica, that I dreamt of the vanity of human greatness among those devastated tombs follows as the vulgar moral issuing from the spectacle itself. But the workings of my mind did not stop at that. I penetrated into the very nature of man. Is all emptiness and absence in the region of the sepulchres? Is there nothing in that nothingness? Are there no existences of nihility, no thoughts of dust? Have those bones no modes of life with which we are unacquainted? Who knows of the passions, the pleasures, the embraces of those dead? Are the things which they have dreamt, thought, expected, like themselves, idealities, engulfed pell-mell with themselves? Dreams, futures, joys, sorrows, liberties and slaveries, powers and weaknesses, crimes and virtues, honours and infamies, riches and miseries, talents, geniuses, intelligences, glories, illusions, loves. Are you but perceptions of a moment, perceptions that pass with the destruction of the skulls in which they take birth, with the extinction of the bosom in which once beat a heart? In your eternal silence, O tombs, if tombs you be, is not heard but a mocking and eternal laughter? Is that laughter the god, the sole derisive reality, which will survive the imposture of this universe? Let us close our eyes. Let us fill up life's despairing abyss with those great and mysterious words of the martyr. I am a Christian. End of Book 3, Part 2